following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. My baby dolls, we are back again. Another episode of Genesis. As always, I am your host, Ian Kahanowitz. And today I'll be talking about the famous Larry Doby. Now, many of you don't know about Larry Doby, but he was the second person besides uh, behind Jackie Robinson to break the color barrier in Major League Baseball in 1947, uh, but he didn't get as much media attention as Jackie, but nonetheless, his story is an amazing one and a long one uh, in, a, in his affiliation with Major League Baseball and the Negro Leagues. But before we get to Mr. Dolby... As always, I am your host, Ian Kahanowitz, and you are listening to the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network with that man of all men, the Zigzag Man, Ralph Taito. And of course, the network is is continuing to grow. I just love being on the network. I've been down and out the last few months since my operation, but we're slowly getting better, and that's a good thing. Yesterday was January 3rd, and a new Congress took over in the House. Uh, We got a new system of checks and balances in Washington. We'll see how that goes uh, by the wayside, or if it's going to make any impact uh, on any government situation, especially uh, the shutdown that has been taking place uh, as I am speaking uh, right now on January 4th. In addition, the hot stove's heating up. Manny Machado and, of course, Bryce Harper still on the market. Yankees signed uh, Troy Tulowitzki the other day for shortstop backup. We'll see how that goes. A lot of baseball is going to be spoken about in the next six weeks until pitches and catches report to in Florida and Arizona as we begin spring training in mid-February, and I can't wait for that. But today... We got some historical baseball for you folks. We got Lawrence Eugene Doby. Now, who was Larry Doby? Larry was an American professional baseball player. He started his career in the Negro Leagues, and he ended up in the Major Leagues. He was the second black player, as I mentioned before, to break the baseball's color barrier. He was born in Camden, South Carolina, and he played three sports and was an all-state athlete. While in high school, in, of all places, Patterson, New Jersey, he accepted a basketball scholarship from Long Island University, and at the age of 17, he began his professional baseball career with the Newark Eagles. Uh, That was the big team in Jersey at the time, uh, owned by Effa Manley. Um, Huge, huge revenue maker for the Negro Leagues and New Jersey. And Doby came on as a second baseman. As a second baseman. Uh, then, of course, he joined the U.S. Navy during World War II. Um, and he returned to baseball in 1946. And along with his teammate, Monty Irvin, helped the Eagles win the Negro League World Series. And so, some things should be said about his days uh, in the Negro Leagues. You know, Negro League umpire Henry Moore uh, advised Newark Eagles owners Abe and Effa Manley to give Doby a tryout at Hinkcliffe Stadium in Patterson, which was successful. He saw potential as an umpire. And like I said before, he joined the Eagles at the age of 17 for $300. Think of that, $300. Today, that would be like $3 million. The contract said Adobe would play until September when he would start classes at college to protect his amateur status. He signed using the alias Larry Walker. And local reporters were told he originated from Los Angeles, California. Of all the secrets, hey, there's a little collusion right there. On May 31st, Adobe appeared in his first professional game when the Eagles played against the New York Cubans at Yankee Stadium. In the 26 games where box scores have been found for the Negro Leagues, because, of course, back in the Negro Leagues, not all games were recorded, so it's hard to tell. Players like Josh Gibson or Satchel Paige, how many strikeouts, how many home runs they would have, because records 
weren't a consistent, ongoing thing as the leagues were scattered across the United States and no one took the task of recording most of the early games. And so in 26 games, <clears throat> uh, Dobie's batting average was 391. That's almost 400. Um, Dobie recalled a game against catcher Josh Gibson and pitcher Ray Brown of the Homestead Grays. And Dobie said this, my first time up, Josh said, we're going to find out if you could hit a fastball. I singled. Next time, Josh said, we're going to find out if you could hit a curveball. I singled. Third time up, Josh said, we're going to find out how you do after you knock down. I popped up the first time after he knocked me down. The second time, I singled. Dobie's career in Newark was interrupted two years to service in the U.S. Navy. He spent 1943 and part of 1944 at Camp Robert Smalls at the Great Lakes Naval Training School near Chicago. He appeared on an all-black baseball squad and maintained a 342 average against teams composed of white players, some of which featured major leaguers. He then went to Treasure Island Naval Base in San Francisco, California, and before serving in the Pacific Theater of War, in World War II, Dobie spent time at Navy sites in Ogden, Utah, and San Diego, California. He was stationed at Ulidi in the Pacific Ocean in 1945. Dobie heard of Jackie Robinson's minor league contract deal with the Montreal Royals of the International League from his base in Ulidi and listening to the um, Force Radios. And as a result, Dobie saw real hope in becoming a Major League Baseball player when he returned to the United States. While in Hawaii, Dobie met fellow Navy man and future teammate Mickey Vernon. Vernon was then with the Washington Senators, was so impressed with Dobie's skills, he wrote to Senators owner Clark Griffith, encouraging Griffith to sign Dobie uh, so that the, M the Major League Baseball Association, well, Major League Baseball, uh, would allow integration. During his time in the Navy, Dobie was described by his colleagues as a quiet and kept-to-himself kind of guy. He was discharged from the Navy in 1946 of January. In that year, he married his longtime wife, uh, Helen Kirby, uh, which they would be married until her death, until 2001. After playing for the San Juan Senators in Puerto Rico, Dobie rejoined the Newark Eagles in 1946. He made the All-Star roster, batted 360, which was fourth in the, in the, the uh, Negro National League, hit five home runs, and led the NL in triples. Manager Biz Mackey led the Eagles, including Dobie, Monty Irving, Johnny Davis, to a Negro League World Series championship over Satchel Page and the Kansas City Monarchs in seven games to conclude the 1946 season. For the series, Dobie hit 372 with one home run, five RBIs, and three stolen bases. Many in the Negro Leagues believe that Dobie or Irvin would be the first to break the MLB color barrier, not Robinson. Uh, considering a career in Major League Baseball, Dobie said, I never dreamed that far ahead. Growing up in a segregated society, you couldn't have thought that this was the way it was going to be. There was no bright spot as far as looking at baseball until Mr. Robinson got the opportunity to play in Montreal in 1946. Now, the integration of the American League took place when you had team president Bill Vec, who also was in World War II, lost his leg, but he would become the manager of um, the Cleveland, of St. Louis Browns, of the Chicago White Sox, and then back to the White Sox again. And he would do the job of integrating the American League, which he wanted to do in Philadelphia in the National League during the war, but was voted down. He was a big believer in integrating, integrating the leagues with uh, black Latinos. He saw the potential vec. He was far ahead of his time. And, and again, um, 
He began the process of finding a young, talented player from the Negro Leagues and told the reporter in Cleveland that he would t- integrate the Indians roster if he could find a black player with the necessarily ta- talent level who can withstand the taunts and pressure of being the first black e- athlete in the American League. The reporter suggested Doby, of whom Vec had seen at the Great Lakes Naval Training School. Doby's name was also mentioned when Vec talked with reporters who covered the Negro Leagues. Indian scout Bill Kilfer rated Doby favorably, and perhaps just as important for Vic, reported Doby's off-field behavior was not a concern. The Dodgers rated Doby their top young Negro League prospect, but unlike the Brooklyn Dodgers Brick Branch Ricky, who signed Robinson one full season before bringing him to the National League, Vic used a different strategy letting Doby remain with the Eagles instead of bringing him through the Indians' farm system. He told the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper, one afternoon when the team trots out on the field, a Negro League player will be out there with it. Now, while Ricky declined to pay for purchasing rights of Robinson when he played for the Kansas City Monarchs, Vec was determined to buy Doby's contract from the Eagles and had no problem purchasing rights for money. Effa Manley, business manager of the Eagles, believed her club's close relationship with the New York Yankees might put Doby in a Yankees uniform, but they did not take interest in him. Vec finalized a contract deal for Doby with Manley on July 3rd. Vec paid her a total of $15,000 for her second baseman, 10000 for taking him from the Eagles, and another $5,000 once it was determined he would stay with the Indians for at least 30 days. After Manley agreed to Vex offer, she said to him, if Larry Doby were white and a free agent, you'd give him $100,000 to sign as a bonus. The press were not told that Doby had been signed by the Indians as Vec wanted to manage how fans in Cleveland would be introduced to Doby. And in his own words, Vec said, I move slowly and carefully, perhaps even timidly. The Eagles had a doubleheader on July 4th, but Doby, who had a 415 batting average and 14 home runs to that point in the season, um, only played in the first as Vec sent his assistant and public relations personal member Louis Jones for Doby. The two took a train from Newark to Chicago where the Indians were scheduled to play the White Sox the next day. On July 5th, with the Indians in Chicago in the midst of a road trip, Doby made his debut as the second black baseball player after Jackie Robinson to play the majors after establishment of the baseball color line. Vec hired two plainclothes police officers to accompany Doby as he went to Comiskey Park. Player manager Lou Badro initially had a hard time finding a place in the lineup for Doby, who had played second base and shortstop for most of his career. Badro himself was the regular shortstop, while Joe Gordon was the second baseman. That day, Doby met his new teammates for the first time, And he remarked, I walked down that line, stuck out my hand, and had very few hands come back and returned. Most of the ones that did were cold fish handshakes, along with a look that said, you don't belong here. Domi reminisced years later uh, about this kind of racism that he experienced. Four out of... Doby's teammates did not shake his hand, and of those, two turned their backs to Doby when he tried to introduce himself. During warm-ups, Doby languished for minutes while his teammates interacted with one another. Not until Joe Gordon asked Doby to play catch with him was Doby given the chance to engage. Gordon befriended Doby and became one of his closest friends on the team. How about that? Now, Doby entered the game in the seventh inning as a pinch hitter for relief pitcher Brian Stevens and recorded a strikeout. In the 1949 movie, The Kid from Cleveland, Vec tells the story that Gordon struck out on three swings in his immediate at-bat after Doby to save face for his new teammate. However, Doby's second strike was the result of a foul ball 
Both the Associated Press and the Chicago Tribune stated Dolby struck out on five pitches instead of three. And in addition, Gordon was standing on third base during Dolby's at bat. From Pride and Prejudice, the biography of Larry Dolby, and I quote, after the game, Dolby quickly showered and dressed without incident in Cleveland Clubhouse. His escort, Louis Jones, then took him not to the Del Prado Hotel downtown where the Indians players stayed, but to the Black Fusable Hotel in Chicago's predominantly black south side near Comiskey Park. The segregated arrangement established a pattern on Dobie's first day that he would be compelled to follow in spring training and during the regular season in many cities throughout his playing career. The Indians had a doubleheader against the White Sox on Sunday, July 6, and 31,566 turned out to the game. It was estimated that approximately 30% of the crowd were black. Some congregations of black churches let out early, while others walked immediately from Sunday service to Comiskey Park. Boudreaux had Doby pinch hit in the first game, but for the second listed him as a starter at first base, a position Doby was not expected to fill when the Indians brought him up to play at second base. Doby had played the position before with the Eagles, but was, out, but was without proper mitt for the first base position and met much resistance when attempts were made to borrow one from teammates, including first baseman Eddie Robinson, for whom Boudreaux had asked Dolby to replace that day. Dolby said only because Gordon asked in the clubhouse to borrow one of the first baseman's mitts did he have one to use in the second game of the doubleheader, as earlier direct requests from Dolby were rejected. The mitt was loaned by a White Sox player, uh, not even Cleveland. Boudreaux recounts the incident where Robinson refused to admit to Doby, but when asked by Indians traveling secretary Spud Goldstein, Robinson obliged. It was the only game Doby started for the remainder of the season. He recorded his first major league hit in four at-bats and had an RBI in a 5-1 to one Indians win. A columnist wrote in The Plain Dealer on July 8th, Cleveland's man in the street is the right sort of American, as was evidenced right solidly once more by the response to the question, how does the signing of Larry Doby of the Indians strike you? Said the man in the street, can he hit? That's all that counts. Conversely, Doby was criticized from players both active and retired. Noted former player Rogers, Rogers Hornsby said after watching Dobie played one time in 47. Bill Vick, Bill Vick did the Negro Lace, new, Negro Lace no favor when he signed Larry Dobie to a Cleveland cat contract. If Vick wanted to demonstrate that the Negro has no place in Major League Baseball, he could have used a subtler means to establish this point. If he were white, he wouldn't be considered good enough to play with a semi-pro club. He is fast on his feet but that lets him out. He hasn't any other quality that could possibly recommend him. Now, in his rookie year, Doby did hit 5 for 32 in 29 games. He played four games in second uh, and won at each first base and shortstop. Throughout the season, he talked with Robinson via telephone, the two encouraging each other, Jackie in the National League, Larry in the American League. And Jackie and I agreed we shouldn't challenge anyone or cause trouble, or we'd both be out of the big leagues just like that. We figured that if we spoke out, we would ruin things for the other black players. After his rookie season, Dolby again pursued time on the basketball court and appeared in the Patterson Crescents of the American Basketball League after signing a contract in January 1948. He was the first back black player to join that league. Now, 1948, Dobie had his first spring training with the Indians in Tucson, Arizona. Unlike their white teammates, Dobie, along with Satchel Page and Minnie Minosa, who are now on the team, were not permitted to stay at the nearby Santa Rita Hotel, but instead stayed at a local black family and used a rental car provided by the Indians for transportation. During spring trading, 
Dolby read books concerning outfield play and received instruction and encouragement from former in, in, in Indians manager and great Tris Speaker and Indians Farm System Director Hank Greenberg. Now, Hank Greenberg, if you recall, was discriminated as a Jew in Detroit during a wave of anti-Semitism in the 1930s. And, of course, Tris Speaker, who was from Texas, who had been rumored to be in the Ku Klux Klan and who was extremely prejudiced um, against Catholics, we know when he moved to Boston, uh, in 1908, 1909, did mentor uh, Dolby. He was one of the finest players uh, to play in the dead ball era and the beginning of the live ball era. And Speaker might have a case uh, to be the best center fielder besides Willie Mays uh, to ever have played that position. And, of course, Dolby got a huge training. Uh, that season at spring training. He also credited Indians coach Bill McKechnie with helping him adjust to the majors and learning the outfield. At exhibition time in Houston against the New York Giants, Dolby hit a home run that may have traveled 500 feet before landing far beyond the fence in center field. As Moore wrote in his biography of Dolby, with that home run, all doubts that Dolby would make the 1948 team, Cleveland team, vanished. That year, he played in 121 games, hit 301 for the season with 14 home runs and 66 ribbies. Throughout the regular season, Dolby was racially abused by opposing teams, and Bill Vecht asked AL President William Harridge to support in getting players to rein in their animosity towards Dolby. And he played a major role in Cleveland's World Series victory against the Boston Braves. In Game 4 on October 9th, Dolby hit the first home run by a black player in a World Series game in its history. A picture featuring an embrace between Dolby and white teammate Steve Gromek, who had pitched a complete game that day, was on the cover of the next day's Plain Dealer. Richard Goldstein of the New York Times called the photograph a signature moment in the integration of Major League Baseball. Of the picture, Dolby said, the picture was more rewarding and happy for me, actually, than hitting the home run. The picture finally showed a moment of a man showing his feelings for me. The Indians defeated the Braves in six games, and with it, Cleveland had his first World Series championship since the 1920 season when they were coached by Tris Speaker. Dolby's 318 batting average during the series led the Indians. Nationally syndicated columnist Grantland Rice argued that without Doby and Gene Bearden, who had won 20 games that year as a pitcher, the Indians would have finished in fourth or fifth place in the American League. After Cleveland, um, with, an ex with an additional income due to his postseason run and series championship, Doby and his wife attempted to buy a home in Patterson in an all-white neighborhood, but were kept out by a petition from members of the community. The Dolbys were allowed to purchase the desired home when the Patterson City Mayor intervened on their behalf. During the 1949 season, Dolby was selected to his first Major League Baseball All-Star game. He was one of five Indians selected by Bordeaux and joined Jackie Robinson, Roy Campanella, and Don Newcomb as the first black players to be among those chosen to participate in the 1949 All-Star Game. Boudreaux fined Dolby after he attempted to steal home with no outs and bases loaded in a game against the Yankees on July 20th. Of the fine, Boudreaux said it was not based on that attempt to steal home. Larry has taken several unnecessarily chances lately. This should make him more careful. His home run... 24 home runs, and ribby total of 85 increased during the 1949 season. And by 1950, he was considered the best center fielder in the game by the Sporting News. By the first week in July, Dolby's 370 batting average trailed only 1949 AL batting championship and champion George Kell, who had a 375 average. He earned career bests in batting average, 326, 
hits 164 and on base percentage of 442 while playing in 142 games. Dolby hit the 100 ribby mark for the first time in his career with 102 while his OBP led the AL. He finished eighth in AL MVP voting amongst the highest of the outfielders. At the end of the season, Cleveland signed him to a new, more lucrative contract. Dolby was named by Cleveland sports writer as Cleveland's baseball man of the year after the season, the first time a black player was chosen. Now, in the 50s was a time of, shall we say, the unions were getting together, um, baseball plays were beginning to feel cheated, the reserve clause was beginning to get questioned. We were still about 15 years away from Marvin Miller, who came in and, of course, changed everything uh, and switched the power from the owners to the um, players. But Dobie asked general manager Hank Greenberg regarding uh, salary, um, but because his, his numbers were declining, Greenberg reduced Dobie's salary uh, due to lower home run numbers, despite Doby attributed the lower numbers to tightness in his legs, stated he would not expect the pay club. Indians manager now, who was Al Lopez, confirmed that Doby was injury riddled throughout the season, saying he was beset by first one injury, then another, then including a muscle tear in his thigh, a groin pull, and ankle twist. Doby received blame for the Indians' failure to win the American League pennant and was labeled a loner by some in the press, including Plain Dealer sports editor Gordon Cobbledick, who in an article in Sport wrote, Larry's a mixed-up guy, badly mixed-up guy, stemming from the emotional impact of discovering racial prejudice against him. Cobbledick also took issue with Doby's assertion that opposing pitchers were knocking him down due to Doby being black. The assertion was confirmed by Sam Lacey, who wrote in the Baltimore Afro-American Statistics show that eight colored players in the two major leagues were hit by pitches a total of 68 times during the 51 campaign, an average of eight and a half times per man. No other player was hit as many as eight times in the season. And what happened now with Dolby, um, in 53 years, the um, Greenberg four um, a raise um, for uh, – by, by Greenberg, and it was granted. Um, but after 1955, it was traded to Chicago, and um, after that, eventually, he would go on to play baseball in Japan. Um, he would be a member of a travel delegation from the U.S. Department of State. Um, he retired as a player became a scout with the new Montreal Expos in 1969 and served as a minor league instructor with the organization the year I was born in 1970. He was a batting coach under manager Gene Mark from 71 to 73 and again in 76. He managed various teams during five seasons of Winter League Baseball in Venezuela, including Anguillas de Zulier during the 1970 to 71 winter season, Dobie rejoined the Indians for the 1974 season as its first base coach for manager Ken Aspermonte. When Aspermonte was fired after the 1974 seasons, the Indians named Frank Robinson the club's player manager and baseball's first black manager. Now, after Robinson was hired as manager, Dobie returned to work out for the Expos. In 1976, Bill Veck purchased the White Sox for a second time and hired Dobie almost 30 years uh, later after he hired him to Cleveland to be the batting coach. As a team, the White Sox finished the 76th season with a lackluster 255 batting average, only 586 run scores, and 73 home runs. By June 29, 1977, the team's average was 284 and recorded 382 runs 
and 87 home runs. They finished the season second team batting average to the Yankees and Red Sox, each with a 281 average and had 192 home runs and 844 runs scored as a team. After firing the White Sox manager and former Dovey teammate Bob Lemon, Zach replaced him with Dovey on June 30th, 1978, and at the age of 53, Dobie became the second black manager in the majors after Frank Robinson. And in his own words, it's no nice to work for a man like Bill Veck. You just work as hard as you can, and if the opportunity arises, you will certainly get the opportunity to fulfill your dreams, Dobie said after being named White Sox manager. And what happened with him after that? They basically continued in the game as scouts. He was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame on March 3, 1998, uh, by the Veterans Committee. Um, and he became the first member, born in South Carolina, elected to the Hall of Fame. Although he was the first to play in Major League Baseball, again, the American League, Dobie was the last member elected to the Hall of the four players to ever play in both the Negro League and Major League Baseball World Series, the others being Satchel Page, Monty Irving, and Willie Mays. Dobie and his wife, Helene, had five kids, six grandkids, and four great-grandkids. When the Dobies moved to Montclair, New Jersey, good old Yogi Berra and his wife became neighborhood friends, and children of the two families played baseball and football together. Doby had a kidney removed in 1997 after a cancerous tumor was detected. Helene, married to Doby for 55 years, died in 2001 after a six-month battle with cancer. Doby died on June 18, 2003, at his home in Montclair, New Jersey, at age 79 after suffering cancer. When Doby died, President George W. Bush made the following statement, and I quote, Larry Doby was a good and honorable man and a tremendous athlete and manager. He had a profound influence on the game of baseball, and he will be missed. As the first African-American player in the American League, he helped lead the Cleveland Indians to their last World Series title in 1948, became a nine-time All-Star, and was voted into the Hall of Fame in 1998. Laura joins me in sending out condolences to Larry's family during this difficult time. Former Major League Baseball Commissioner Bud Selig released a statement a day following Dobie's death, and he, I quote, like Jackie, he endured the pain of being a pioneer with grace, dignity, and determination, and eased the way for all who followed. He achieved another historic 31 years later, became the second African-American to manage a big league club following Frank Robinson. And former Major League Baseball Commissioner Faye Vincent said, Larry's role in history was recognized slowly and belatedly, who broke the color line first, but in the same year, quite naturally, received most of the attention. Larry played out his career with dignity and slid gracefully into various front office positions in basketball and later baseball. Only in the 90s did baseball wake up to the obvious fact that Larry was every bit deserving of recognition as Jackie Robinson. And that, my friends, I will end over here. That is a great way to end this. I hope you enjoyed the show on Larry Doby. Another important figure in baseball history. Um, I'll be doing more generous this podcast coming up. Some would get, some would not. Hope you enjoyed this episode. And of course, as I always end my show, in the immortal words of my hero, Edward R. Murrow, good night, folks. Good luck. Take care. The proceeding was a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you for listening.